Hello folks, welcome to the second installment of the Living History Series with Dr. Joel Collier for the 2023 uh, cohort of the International Euphonium Summit. Uh, we, we're so happy to have you back, especially post uh, British Open performance. Yeah, it's uh, glad to be here and talk about it. Absolutely. Uh, we dove in a little bit before this for 30 minutes, uh, or 20 minutes rather, of listening to him uh, kind of go over British Open on that Saturday and then playing with Black Dyke the next day uh, and really, really cool stuff. Uh, check that out on your favorite podcast uh, that will be released uh, post uh, video. So, yes, with further ado, let's pick up where we left off and we're going to head back to uh, high school and prepping for college and you had that amazing performance uh, in Cincinnati uh, just uh, your junior year correct so yeah I had a few things that uh, with Curtis right yeah with Curtis Institute so that was in Philadelphia I had a few things coming up that was my that was the autumn of my senior well it was my senior year I do know that I don't remember exactly which season it was but uh, that was my senior year. Yeah, playing with Curtis Institute of Music. Got that phone call. They were doing the Awazen Symphony in Brass. Needed euphonium. Uh, I go to the first rehearsal and uh, it's only two rehearsals in the gig. And um, I'm told at the first rehearsal that Eric Awazen will be in the audience for the performance. So, you know, nothing like a little pressure. Um, but I have the recording of that and I listened back to it and I, I'm really pleased with the way it went. It was an amazing experience and I met a few really great people there. Uh, some of them that have gone on to do really great things. I know one of the trumpet players at the time was Stanford Thompson, uh, who did, uh, the play on Philly and tune up Philly programs. Um, you know, those were his brainchild. And so, yeah, just met some great people. The conductor was Paul Bryan, who, uh, was um connected with you know he was there with curtis and he's still at curtis um and got connected with him and that led to a lot of great things uh, including playing with bravo brass with philadelphia youth orchestra's brass choir um and even led to later on you know he got connected with the university that i attended which we'll talk about that in a bit so yeah it was a phenomenal experience and a great introduction to that scene um the university slash professional brass scene in Philadelphia. So I have a question uh, to see where composition like shows its face in your life. Where did where does that fall into the realm of things? I know it's not discussed in your bio except for, you know, different competitions you've been in. But yeah. where, where, where does that play a role uh, in your early life? So this is a fascinating thing. I um, I was always a bit of a music theory nerd. Uh, so there was a uh, um, chose music uh, chose publishing did a uh, music theory series called Master Theory, and it was six books. The first book took you from this is a staff and these are the lines and spaces to book six was basic harmony and arranging. Um, and I remember that I finished book six when I was twelve. So the question was then, okay, what next? Um, and uh, m for my 12th birthday, um, my parents bought a copy of Sibelius. Wow. The music notation software. <laughs> so, yes. so they bought a copy of Sibelius for my 12th birthday. Um, and my mom uh, was working for the Salvation Army at the time in the music department. And her boss was Dr. Dr. Harold Bergmeier who um, is a composer. He has his doctorate in music theory and composition. Um, and so he started giving me not regular, but occasional lessons, both in advanced theory and harmony um, and in music composition. Wow. So I was able to get that mentorship um, through really the end of middle school and high school directly from him, uh, which was incredibly influential. So from a, I, you know, I started writing um, and as with anybody, when they first start out, it's not very good. That's just you, do, but you are encouraged and you keep writing. Um, and I remember that um, 
I, in my junior year of high school, I applied for and was accepted to Pennsylvania Governor's School for the Arts, which was a summer program uh, at in Pennsylvania. So it ran between in the summer between junior and senior year. I was there in at Mercyhurst College in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, and I was actually there as a um, as a music composition concentration. I wasn't there for performance. Uh, you, of course, you you play when you're there. I played both. I took euphonium lessons and played trombone in you know in the jazz ensemble and things like that. But I was there as a composition student, so I was taking composition lessons as well, um, uh, and studying with some great people. Uh, George W. Russell Jr., who's one of the harmony teachers at Berklee School of Music, and um, you know. Just a lot of really great people. Lars Hall, who's a jazz uh, composer. And um, these were some of the people that were the instructors that while I was there. So I was taking, I was studying with them. Um, and the piece that I actually submitted, uh, at, one of the two pieces I submitted as part of my portfolio to be accepted there was actually a two-part vocal piece, two-part voice and piano um, that actually then went on to be my very first published piece of music. Uh, I wrote it when I was 16 years old, and when I was 19, it was, I think 19, maybe 18, it was published. <clears throat> so that was my very first piece of published music. Um, and uh, But I was also writing a lot for brass bands, because that was my whole background. And uh, and so I was writing, I remember my first, my, my first brass composition that uh, is still around and still would see the light of day was a piece that I did when I was uh, also 16 and was premiered uh, by a band that I um, played in and, and then also performed by Atlantic Brass Band when I was a senior in high school, when I was 17. So composition was something that was very important to me, um, even though I didn't have any formal education, I had that mentorship from, from Harold Bergmeier. That's intriguing. So you didn't, did you start with any, like, did you start with any arrangements or did, I did. you? Just, oh, okay. Okay. Yes. I, I absolutely started with arrangements and transcriptions, just trying to understand how to construct, how to orchestrate, how to just understand, you know, what other people were already doing. Um, and in fact, that's one of the things that you're doing when you're studying, you know, uh, harmony, at least the way that a lot of these things do is they'll give you a melody and then say, okay, harmonize the melody. So you're already coming from that arranging perspective. Um, and I know that the first piece of music that I actually had played was strictly an arrangement. There was, there was not even anything. Uh, it was, it was not a transcription because it wasn't a note for note reproduction, but it was a, it was an arrangement that really did not depart very far from the original just the only departure was scoring, instrumentation, things like that. So, uh, but even still to have that performed live, to have that experience and to have that feedback from the people playing it uh, is is a tremendous thing. Um, and it's, it's uh, yeah, so arranging, and that's been a lot of what I've done over my career has been arranging. Um, you know, I, and transcribing, um, I, I've done some bigger things. I've done uh, some transcription for brass band that were contracted, where I've done, you know, uh, uh, Alan Vizzuti's tuba concerto. I did the brass band transcription of that one and things like that, where I've been able to just because I understand the medium so well, I was able to just kind of uh, be in the right place at the right time to be hired to do those kinds of things. Absolutely. So going back to that two part vocal voice and piano uh, part uh, piece, at 16, first published at 19, did you get any um, engagement or did you seek the engagement from those that you were writing the piece for? Uh, kind of like guidelines or how did that go? So that was an interesting thing. I uh, That was published by the Salvation Army in New York um, and it was for a particular journal that they had. Uh, so they published every few years where they would publish a book of a dozen, maybe 15 of these two part vocal pieces. Oh, okay. um, And so I knew of that, I knew that that was kind of my target for publication. 
Uh, so no, I wasn't receiving really so so much guidelines from them and direction from them, just that I knew that if I wanted it to fit that publication, then I had to write it in this way. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, tangent right there. Mm -hmm. If y'all hear what Dr. Joel Collier just said, is that applies to every facet in this life that we live, is making sure that the target that you want to attain facilitating what you're working on whether it's your program or solo or or just a, a article or a blog like for a class that you may be writing for or you know an assignment you have to fit the that what you're doing with what's being requested or kind of the target audience he did is that something dr harold bergmeier like mentioned to you while you were studying or where did you pick that piece up it's it's a fascinating thing because i don't know it's something he may have mentioned but it was never something that was particularly hammered home until i was in college so after this happened um so when i was in my undergrad uh at drexel university i had a professor named jim klein and uh i was in a class i think it was audio for video or something like that, where we were creating, uh, we were creating essentially, you know, what you might consider background music tracks for different, that could be utilized for different things. Maybe music that you might hear on the weather channel or things like that. Um, and he was going over uh, the guidelines for submission um, of our projects, our homework. And it was very specific instructions that it had to be a certain type of file and it had to be burned onto a CD in a slimline jewel case with a thing in the front that had this very specific information on it. And he flat out said to us, if it is not submitted according to these guidelines under this format, it does not matter how good your project is, it will be a zero because in the real world, when you are submitting this kind of information, or submitting this kind of material, he said, you know, these publishing houses are getting hundreds and hundreds of submissions a day. They don't have the time to look through them all. So the way that they weed them out is if it doesn't match their criteria, they don't even look at it. And so that was a lesson that was driven home actually very clearly when I was actually formally studying this uh, music industry and music technology. Uh, but I think it was something that I was kind of just aware of. Um, I knew of different publications, choral publications, band publications, and I knew that particularly the band publications that they published different scorings. I knew uh, four different brass band scorings for four different, more than four different publications, but I knew four different scorings and which publications required which scorings they published in this scoring. So where so did you learn that information? That was something that I learned through my score study, uh, you know, studying with Dr. Bergmeier, where wow. we would look at different scores. Um, and you can just see them on the page because, you know, one would, for example, the American Band Journal that has published several of my works now, that's supposed to be a flexible scoring. So they have mandatory parts, uh, but then they also have optional parts that can be included. Um, and that's just something that, that you learn when you are playing from that series and studying that series. And then if you have any interest in being published in that series, it has to fit that criteria. Um, yeah, so, so that was something that I was just aware of. And that is actually a great thing for anybody listening to this. Please be aware of that. There are people that do get to break the rules, but the people that get to break the rules are the ones that have been uh, established for a long time and are very, very well respected. You know, if uh, Hans Zimmer wants to write for your publication and wants to break your rules, well, the publication is gonna allow Hans Zimmer to break the rules. But if I wanna write for a publication uh, and say, I wanna break the rules, they're gonna tell me, uh, no, no, thank you. That's phenomenal input. Um, wow. So what was, did you get to play any of your trans, uh, transcriptions or I, I have two parts uh, to this question is when you started working with arrangements and transcriptions, did you 
look at any solo parts that you would like uh, that you were intrigued about and then utilize that and then in turn play them for Dr. Harold Bergmeier or your current brass band that you were in at the time? So I, it's an interesting thing. I would write for, there, there were some times that I was writing specifically for groups that I knew who was going to play it. Um, but when I was younger, that was not mm -hmm. so much the case. When I was younger, it was writing it and then kind of bringing it to people saying, here is this thing that I wrote. Could you please maybe look at it? Uh, by the way, that's where everybody starts. In, in case you're wondering, you write something and then you ask people to look at it. Um, but so that's what I was doing. And sure, when I was writing some of the euphonium parts, you know, maybe I was writing them in a way that I was interested in. Um, but it wasn't uh, so specific, so overt, uh, you know, that I was writing it for myself. Um, it was more... Uh, that I was writing for the medium and the medium happened to include my instrument. So um, now that did change as I got older and through my uh, through my composition career, now I have actually written uh, several euphonium solos that I wrote for myself. Um, you know, of course, to be published and played by other people as well, but I wrote them to be premiered by myself. I wrote them so that I could play them. I can't um, wait to dive into those exclusively uh, for what I have. Uh, I don't think we mentioned it on your specific series, but really cool, uh, like, kind of teaser out there for those listening right now and for yourself. Um, I going So we're going to touch base with all the solo works and stuff like that, um, maybe in one pod, uh, one episode exclusively. Uh, so I'm going to parlay that and mm -hmm. ask, what was your favorite score to study and utilize when you were doing these transcriptions and arrangements first starting out? Did you have a favorite? Uh, it's hard to say I had a favorite. Um, I do remember this is a really interesting story. It also uh, shows how old I am by a little bit. I'm, I'm not that old, but I do predate the easy accessibility of online score databases. Um, because I do remember when I was, I believe in high school, but early in high school, maybe 14, 15, uh, I went to um, the uh, opera in Philadelphia and saw um, a masked ball. Uh, and I remember listening to just even before the curtain came up, just listening to the overture, thinking this is incredible. Uh, and that was my first exposure to it and my first exposure to high Italian opera like that. And uh, I remember the next day I went into the Philadelphia Public Library, the main building of the Philadelphia Public Library to access the score archive, the Philadelphia Library. And I checked out the score to a masked ball and I took it home to just understand and study what was happening um, and how uh, how it was constructed and things like that. And I do, I never finished it, but I did start making a transcription of that for Brass Band. Later found out that one already existed. So it's probably good that I didn't finish mine. Uh, and especially being as young as I was, it wasn't probably gonna be as good as the published one. But I learned a lot from, from that exercise, even though it never was finished. So that was one that was really important to me. But then other ones that maybe I didn't really do so much, um, tr like I didn't transcribe this, but a score that I that was so important to the way that I thought about particularly arranging. Um, growing up in the Salvation Army, I did a lot of arranging of hymn tunes, which obviously hymns have text. Um, and I remember had, since I was studying with Dr. Bergmeier, one of his pieces, is a piece called Abide With Me, just using that hymn tune, Abide With Me. And his setting of it was so uh, influential, just studying it and understanding how he married the music to the text, that how he illustrated the text through his, his orchestration, through his harmony, through the textures that he would create. Um, that was incredibly influential to the way that I thought 
about marrying the text to the music in any of those hymn arrangements that I did through and still do through the rest of the rest of my life. Um, so that was another score that was a huge, 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 huge uh, influence in my composing. So to kind of jump ahead or just to inquire about when composing or reflecting from a poem or prose uh, article or such like that, does that come to play just like how you would or have done with hymnals? Yeah, um, that's that's the thing. A, a well-written text, it doesn't matter if it's religious or secular. It doesn't matter if it is, you know, a poem or if it is, as you said, you know, prose. It, it, a well-written text is a well-written text that's going to have um, something about it that, that you can illustrate in the music. Um, and so, yeah, I've done some of that, even with things that are purely instrumental. Um, sometimes you'll take it even from the just the source material might be more historical than literary. literary. Um, there's a piece that I wrote uh, called The Land of the Painted People. That is I was just story. looking at that one. <laughs> yeah, it's the story of the Roman conquest of, the, of Britain. And uh, so while it's not on any text or it's not on any, um, you know, poem or thing like that, it is still constructed to be uh, illustrative of that idea. Um, illustrate of historical events so that you can capture those feelings and those emotions and those scenes through the music. Yeah. And, and do you have any, uh, in that specific piece, Land of the Painted People, and being so, mm, I think the word would be influenced, but I may fall short on that actual use of word. In the historic times, do you have influences of kind of the attributes movies like kind of throw out there with like King Arthur and, you know, Stonehenge and yeah, kind of the those, mystics? Those things are always going to be, I mean, it's nobody writes in a vacuum. You know, uh, I am a product of, <laughs> yes, I am a product of everything that I've consumed up to this point in my life. So, um, of course, you know, you, you're never going to fully get away from that. And there are moments of that piece that, you know, and now that I've written it and I can reflect back, having taken a step back from it, that are definitely <clears throat> influenced by things like Hans Zimmer in Gladiator and things like that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. It, it wasn't a conscious decision. It wasn't uh, an effort to, to to imitate, um, but we do have certain images in our, you know, oral landscapes when we think of uh, battles or when we think of sometimes just Rome itself or when we think of, you know, these different things, there are oral landscapes that sound correct to us just based on films or other depictions through uh, music history. So, uh, you know, nothing was ever intentional or imitative uh, in that strict sense but yeah those things are going to seep in because that's what the listener recognizes as well um it's just like uh when people are going for a sound that sounds like rural america a lot of what they're going to do is going to sound like aaron copeland yeah it's not that they're trying to necessarily imitate aaron copeland it's that that's also what their audiences associate with the idea of the sound of rural america like rodeo and the cowboys and Right. In, yeah, in the Wild West. Man, right. that's, that's really intriguing uh, and awesome. Question about Philadelphia, a masked ball opera. Who yes. took you to that performance or did you go solo or how? Um, I think uh, I'm, I'm sure that my, my brother went with me. I'm sure of that because we went to all of those kinds of things together. Um, it might have been my dad, but we also went to some of those things a bit solo. Um, what it was is, again, we were homeschooled, but they did a, um, the Philadelphia Opera Company did a, a thing where it was uh, the, one of their final dress rehearsals for each uh, opera was go, would be for schools. Yes. Um, and you so they had that, that access. Yeah. And so they had that access for homeschools, homeschoolers as well. So we were able to get tickets wow. and 
Yeah, so we went to a, a, quite a few operas. I, I mean, I really enjoyed it. Uh, um, you know, Don Giovanni and Masked Ball and, um, you know, uh, I'm, many others. I, it's hard for me to just remember which ones I saw there or which ones I've seen since. But yeah, it was, it was at the Academy of Music in Philadelphia. So, okay, I'm curious, have you ever attempted or, you know, you, you mentioned that you started writing a brass band arrangement of a mass ball, mm -hmm. but have you ever attempted a libretto or, or I, and I, I fail to, uh, it, it's a new term because some in our cohort actually have written for opera, uh, right. and, and it's, it's a, a fantastical idea. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious to see where you're at with this whole idea of, bringing or even considering brass band playing in the opera or something yeah yeah well so there's a couple of things here that i i, I want to hit on uh <laughs> funny thing that many people might not realize is uh the idea of brass band if you consider brass band being you know the sax horns and things like that that we now consider tenor horns and um it does exist in the world of opera. It, it, it absolutely does. In Berlioz's opera Les Troyennes, the Trojans, um, it actually has on stage performers playing saxhorn families as if they're a marching band, um, but the, the brass band sound. And it also features even a tenor horn solo in the orchestra, uh, has cornets and other saxhorns in the orchestra. So this brass band idea actually does exist in the world of opera. Um, not exclusively, and I don't think that there is an opera yet that is accompanied by a brass band rather than an orchestra, but it does exist. There's that little tidbit there. Um, but I uh, I have not yet done uh, written an opera or a musical. Uh, I was involved in the arranging of the music for a musical uh, that opened in uh, Pennsylvania, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania in 20, 2011, 2012? 2012 um, that was called the Centurion. So uh, I was involved in the arrangement or the arranging of that, which was a great experience. Um, and I do hope to one day write, uh, I actually haven't considered as much opera, but more musical theater. Um, I won't say too much because I don't want to give it away in case, in case I never actually get around to doing this one and instead of writing another one. But there is a, there's a one act music uh, musical that I would very much like to write that is based on um, a short uh, play slash novel. And uh, so, yeah, I, I do hope to write that. Um, What's I kinda, stopping you? Well, it's it's a time thing. It's not it's not a lack of interest. It's a, it's a lack of time. Um, but I do hope to write it. I've already written some sketches and, and things like that. Uh, it's very consuming. It would have to be one of those things to write in pockets of time and hope for continuity eventually. Perhaps, perhaps sooner than later. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, we we have we dove into just a tidbit of college at Drexel University uh, with uh, Jim Klein and the AV class of sorts. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's uh, wow. Um, definitely worth the price of admission. Uh, <laughs> um, what was it like auditioning for Drexel? So Drexel is a very different uh, experience to most uh, music schools, um, you know, and we'll t we could talk about graduate school later, but that would have been more what most people would expect when you think of a music school audition. Um, Drexel, the only music major at Drexel uh, for undergraduate was music industry. And the only other one was music therapy for graduate students. So there was no music education, no music performance, no any of that kind of stuff. Um, and it was also a very particular and very small program. Um, they only, at the time, only accepted 50 students a year. Uh, and it was a pretty large application pool. So it was different. Um, I actually didn't have to do an audition to get accepted into the school or the program. I did have to, of course, apply, and I did have to submit a portfolio because they it's considered more of a design um, program. But so I did have to submit a portfolio. 
Um, and then when I did know that I was going there, then I got connected with the director of bands because they did have a band that was there for, you know, made up of both music industry majors, but also a lot of non-music majors. Um, and I did come in on audition for him. Um, so I, I did have an audition, but it wasn't to get into the, the school. It was just really so that the band director knew who I was and could place me in seating in the band. When did Drexel become like on your radar as far as your homeschooling years? So Drexel was one that was on my radar for a number of years because they were one of the big sponsors of the Delaware Valley Science Fair. Um, and I was one that uh, did the science fair every year from eighth grade through fin finishing high school. I think it might have even been before eighth grade, maybe sixth grade. But anyway, middle school and high school, I did the science fair every year and did a lot of projects that were combining music and science in some way. Some were math and music projects, some were physics and music projects and things like that. Um, and I actually won a, an award uh, at the Delaware Valley Science Fair that was um, sponsored by Drexel. So it was also even on my, my radar then. Um, but I still hadn't really considered it because I knew it was a science school and I wanted to be a music major. Uh, um, but when I started looking into music programs, uh, I, I have a twin brother and he wanted to do music education. And I really wanted to do music performance, but my parents really encouraged me to say, let's get a different music degree, one that has a more applicable skill. And then if you want to do performance, that's fine down the road, but let's do something else first. So I didn't want to do the same thing as my twin brother. So I wanted to do music production. And I started researching music production schools. Um, and uh, I knew somebody that went to Lebanon Valley College that uh, did very well there um, and you know, was looking for things like that. But uh, Drexel um, was at the time the number two music industry school in the country behind Full Sail in Florida. Uh, and it was right in my own backyard. So I figured I better apply. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that was kind of junior year. I started kind of researching schools for that music production idea. Uh, and obviously, I had already been aware of Drexel because of the sponsorship through the science fair and things like that. So to see them pop up right at the top of the list, I was very excited. So it's interesting. You named Drexel as the science fair sponsor. Drexel as second in the nation at that time for music production behind Full Sail. What was your 12th grade year like? doing that science fair for the school that you wanted to go to? So it was interesting. Uh, my senior year, I did a follow-up project to the project I had done the year before. Um, I was measuring, uh, it was an acoustical physics uh, project where I was kind of talking about the acoustical designs of different shaped concert halls and things like that. Sure. Um, so it was a great project. Uh, and junior year, it was that project went particularly well. I, I won um, best of fair at the Delaware County Fair. And then, you know, that was the year that I actually won that smaller prize from Drexel was my junior year. My senior year, um, I did a follow on project where I was actually doing um, some some physical testing of uh, some mock ups of some some concert halls. So I was building miniature models of these concert halls and doing acoustical testing. Do you have any um, pictures of those by chance still? Uh, I don't Does know. I have to ask my mother probably. Um, but I, I remember doing that. And uh, somebody that I knew from church was an architectural graduate student at University of Pennsylvania. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So I was able to go into her architectural studio. And actually, no, she had finished already. So she was working for an architecture firm. And uh, we went into the firm and she was able to, you know, make me some 3D CAD models and things like that. It was amazing. Um, so, yeah, that kind of thing also led very well, I think, into part of my acceptance into the music industry program because I was coming from it from that scientific and analytical perspective. Um, so did you put that in your portfolio going into your application? Uh, it was mentioned, my portfolio was more about some of the uh, compositions I had done and some recordings that I had uh, done and been involved with. 
Um, but of course it was absolutely mentioned on my application. Um, you know, the, it was, I'm sure pretty prominently on my application. Okay. So what was your favorite, uh, concert hall, re uh, model to build? Uh, so they were, uh, when I was doing those models, they were just, uh, generic shapes. They weren't modeled after any particular halls. Um, I, I did not get into that level of, I didn't have that kind of a budget or that kind of time <laughs> to, sure, fair. to do specific. So it was more because what I was testing was was really the different shapes of concert halls. Because there are some where you know you have uh, more of a, a longer you know the Boston Symphony Hall where it's just a long rectangle. You have things like in Philadelphia where it's the Verizon Hall and the Kimmel Center that's shaped like a cello. Um, you have others that are more uh, unusual shapes and. Some that their performance in the round where the stage is in the center of the hall, which is actually the most natural way that we listen to music. Because if you think about people playing on the street, everybody just surrounds them. Um, so uh, so it was more just testing did, did those. You, did you by chance kind of geeking out on a second? Uh, so pardon the, it's still relative as the, the Shakespearean theater. Uh, the globe yes i didn't do that uh that was because i was looking at specifically things designed for music there's been interesting to be to the the rebuild of the globe now in london uh, uh and to think about it from that perspective also one of the halls that i did write about specifically uh in both years in my research was royal albert hall in london <laughs> um, and so since those years since when i was 16 and 17 years old uh, Royal Albert Hall has been on my bucket list to perform in, and, and uh, guess I what? Perform in it next month. <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah. this interview is taking place September twenty seventh, twenty twenty three. Uh, for those that are noting, and it's uh, will be on the uh, YouTube recording uh, at the time of uh, upload. Uh, it's so cool um, to hear, kind of a full circle. I mean. Did you tell your parents? So I, I'm, I'm really curious. When did it become on your radar to? And going back to our podcast before this, as before we started the record. When did you first like know of the Corey Band and Black Dyke? That's the first question. I'll stop with that so you can yeah. answer. Um, I was aware of Black Dyke Band uh, younger. Um, I. I I think that's just one of those bands that in my recollection, since being aware of different brass bands, that's just one of those bands I've always been aware of. Um, Corey Band, I was aware of shortly thereafter. I know certainly by high school, I was aware of the Corey Band. Um, and in college is when I was in college is when they were winning everything. So I was mm -hmm. very aware of them then. Okay, um, so when, when did your, uh, did you ever tell your parents that one day you would like to be a part or be near or actually go listen live or any of that effect? Yeah, um, I I don't think so. Like, well, to listen, absolutely. And that was one of those things that, uh, you know, I've seen both bands live before uh, different times throughout my life. Um, but uh, to to be part of, uh, it was not something that I ever even really crossed my mind until I was thinking about graduate school. Um, and I did uh, apply for and was accepted to both the Royal Welsh College here in Cardiff and the Royal Northern College in Manchester for my master's degree. I just couldn't afford to do either one at the time. Um, but so, of course, when I was applying for those, when I was thinking about that, that was something that was very much on my mind. Um, I had some friends that had come over and done that They when they did their graduate studies uh, at some of those schools they had played with some of the top bands in the area so uh that was i think the first time that it was on my radar to kind of think about it but i thought that once i decided not to go for my master's degree then then that was the end of that i did i thought that that i didn't think that that was going to come back around so okay so we're uh, going to segue uh from the beginning of college at drexel and ferry over into our post uh, interview content and conversation uh, on our podcast. So if you're listening now and watching this, uh, go find the uh, recording that will be listed eventually on 
uh, internationaleuphoniumsummit.com slash joel-collier or in this YouTube link I will be posting uh, to your favorite, hopefully your favorite podcast channel to listen to these uh, ex- this exclusive content uh, as per, you know, not on the YouTube segment. Um, so thank you so much for joining us for this recorded version. We'll actually get to college at Drexel University with Dr. Joel Collier uh, on his third in series as we recapped uh, amazing content from Science Fair, geeking out on that, opera, uh, jumping back into transcriptions, arranging, um, composition. Uh, I'm so glad we circled back around and uh, got to uh, follow up on that first in series and his composition uh, journey. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us, uh, Dr. Joel Collier. Yeah, thank you. And thank you everyone for watching. We'll see you next time.